Good afternoon. This is Dan Bell. We are here on Wednesday, June 26th with Paul Robinson, President and CEO of Aerotech Research in Newport News. Um, and first, let me apologize to the audience. If you hear some coughing, that's because you hear some coughing. I've got a little bit of a upper respiratory thing. I apologize for that. But Paul, thank you very much for taking time out of your busy schedule to, to meet with me today. Oh, you're welcome. And uh, why don't we start off by just telling us a little bit about your uh, personal background. <clears throat> so as you can probably hear, um, I'm from Scotland. I was born there, grew up, did a bachelor's in engineering in Glasgow. And uh, then I, w I was in grad school, went to grad school in uh, Toronto, Canada, in um, aerospace engineering and uh, ended up down in Hampton Roads when I got a job at uh, NASA Langley Research Center in 1990. Outstanding. I love your accent, and I've been to your wonderful country as well. When's the last time you were there? A couple of years ago. Yeah, beautiful, beautiful. Um, now take us through uh, a, a um, description about uh, Aerotech Research, um, when you started it, how you, how you got it off the ground, etc. So... Uh, it started after I had been working at uh, NASA Langley for a few years as a contractor. Um, I then decided time to uh, um, to start a consulting business on the side. Uh, that other interests we were looking at uh, different uh, technologies. This was a technology company, and uh, so that that was ongoing in the background for about a year or two before we picked up. Uh, a couple of big contracts. When I say we, it was it was me um, at first, and that as the uh, the contracts built up, and these were typically government research contracts. Um, then uh, I had to decide around about 1998 or so, uh, or 97, to uh, expand out and start to grow the company uh, to be able to uh, to get all the work done. So uh, the company started in '94, so it was about uh, four or five years of uh, various levels of, of work before it got started. Very good. And can you tell us about the primary product of your company, if you will, be it uh, physical or intellectual? So <clears throat> at first it was uh, general consulting services, particularly in the aerospace aviation uh, sector. And that was for the first uh, four or five years, that was really the the product that we were uh, uh, we, we were selling. First of all, starting with me, and then adding two or three more people on, and uh, and growing it up. Uh, we got to a total of fifteen people about five years ago, and then scaled back as uh, as, as as work came and went. Um, from the government work we developed several uh, technology commercial products mm -hmm. uh, and in the past uh, five to seven years that's been a period of commercialization as we've moved away from the government services and more into these commercial uh, product areas. And so I'm um, doing a little bit of research on your company um, uh, you do wind shear technology, turbulence, things of that nature? Yeah we we found a niche between uh, the um, in, in the general problem of atmospheric hazards uh, to aircraft in flight, uh, we found our niche in making the connection between the characterization of the atmospheric hazard and what it does to the aircraft and how you can provide information to the flight crews to, uh, uh, to mitigate the situation. And that seems to be where we've found ourselves uh, in, in several different areas, in, including uh, wind shear and turbulence and uh, uh, of late um, uh, wakes behind uh, aircraft. Oh, fascinating. Jet, jet uh, yeah. turbine wakes. Interesting. Well, it, it's, it's more the wakes off the wings. When, when, really? When, when uh, an aircraft gets too close behind another aircraft, uh, there are these very, very fast, powerful um, rotating vortices that come off the wingtips of an aircraft and uh, an aircraft following too closely can if it flies into those uh, vortices can flip over mm -hmm. and that's uh, that, that's a serious uh, condition a serious accident particularly near the ground but it also limits how close aircraft can follow behind each other which in turn limits how many airplanes you can get in and out of an airport at any one time so if you're starting to, um, if, if you want to maximize the throughput in an airport, you need to know how close you can pack the airplanes together. That's fascinating. In fact, uh, when you're when you're talking about this, I, I think back to the movie Top Gun and uh, mm -hmm. 
and Maverick, if I recall, Tom Cruise's character went down in some jet wash. Yeah. If I, uh, and so it's kind of related to all that, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. That's fascinating. Paul, are you a pilot? Uh, a lapsed pilot. All right. Yeah. All right. Very good. Okay. Um, so uh, let's talk about like when you launched your company and you talked about your, your career at NASA Langley and the startup. What were some of the the challenges that you had and how did you overcome those challenges? Well, um, <laughs> uh, as, as with so many small companies, I, I had to incorporate in a hurry because there was a contract coming down the line and uh, I needed a company. And so um, I had to do a lot of things very quickly, including think of a name, uh, think, think of what type of a company and, and get the entity set up. So I went into it without a whole lot of uh, uh, pre-study and, uh, and information on the business side. But what I found was I, what I, I had no problem getting a decent lawyer an accountant. Those those were the two things, mm -hmm. and they helped guide me through. And um, a couple, couple of things I didn't do quite right, but most of the things that I I, I did get mm -hmm. right, and it was it was because I got good help. Well, that's that's very important, and uh, no jokes about good good uh, good lawyers or good accountants no. because they're 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 uh, oh, I don't want to say they're worth the weight in gold because the rates the rates well. are going to go up to us, <laughs> but uh, but yeah, extremely valuable. Yeah. So it's all about finding the right people to support. Yeah, you. And, you know, I really found that uh, I started my company about the same time as a, as a friend of mine was starting his, and he he bought all the books and read all the books. And was still reading them by the time I'd, I'd incorporated them, was on to my first job. But uh, I'm sure he was better informed, but uh, at some point you got to get on. Good for you, good for you. And so um, so you launched, and then uh, you, you talk about the, the growth curve uh, in year one, year two. How did you manage that growth? Well, it wasn't so hard until, because um, I, I, I could manage it when it was just me, I could manage, uh, that, that was easy. But... But then you, when you start to grow the organization from one to two to four to six, uh, things get different very, very quickly. Uh, mm -hmm. I did not want to be the, the sort of company that just hires and fires uh, mm -hmm. uh, just just based on the level of work. I wanted to have some sort, some level of consistency for, for my employees, and mm -hmm. I've always tried to do that. So um, it, gets, it, 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 it gets to be uh, tricky managing the growth and making sure you don't get overextended and uh, I've been fairly conservative in doing it um, but it's it it's not easy it's a, no. it's, a it's a very tricky thing to no, do. No you're absolutely right I've uh, I've had experience managing organizations with uh, with several hundred and uh, and for instance at Canon we went through all of the recessions we never laid off a single single person as a result of uh, layoffs or anything like that so it's all about maintaining it just like you're you're finding the right people to help you start up the right people to, to maintain your business is incredibly yeah. important right and we've been very lucky here uh, very low turnover that's great and uh, the guys I've, I've got working with me they've they've all been here uh, at least seven years so, you know, that's it's, excellent. It, it's good. That's excellent. So um, we'll go out a little, a little bit out of sequence, but we'll kind of continue on the your business culture, mm -hmm. expectations, philosophy. We'll touch upon that for a little while. And you, you talk about the importance of your personnel and the longevity of your personnel. And, uh, and that's, uh, that's extremely good. So. Yeah. So um, <clears throat> what, what we find is that in a in a small uh, entity like this, there, there's really no no room for the luxury of stovepipes. So we always mm -hmm. try and make sure, you know, if someone gets hit by the proverbial bus, mm -hmm. that uh, you know the company's not put out of action for any any length of time. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, it's really a question just of of managing all of the uh, all of the resources. And uh, you know, as I said, we've been up at fifteen, fifteen, sixteen people. Mm -hmm. um, and, and back down again, but for for yeah. some reason, just just the way that it, it's worked out, we've never had to lay anyone off. Fantastic! Doesn't that make you feel good? And of course, it makes yeah. your employees feel good that there's yeah. some stability. Things you know. have things have always worked out that uh, someone found something else or something else worked out, and so mm -hmm. good. so even the managing the even though you have low attrition, managing attrition as a factor yeah. in your your personnel ranks has has been very effective for you. Yeah, yeah, and it was also it was made extra exciting when we rolled out our first suite of commercial products in two thousand and eight, mm -hmm. which 
which was not a great time to uh, uh, sweet timing, uh, Paul. Sweet timing. <laughs> yeah. Well, but uh, persevering through through that period of time is a wonderful thing. Let's loop back around now and pick up where we left off. In terms of financing your business startup, uh, uh, without going into any detail mm-hmm. that uh, that's uncomfortable to you, but uh, personal financing, SBA loans, etc. Yeah. So we've we have we. we We've not been big enough or fast growing enough to be of interest to venture capital. Mm-hmm. Um, and in fact, the more that I, I learn and know about venture capital, it's not, it's not always the right solution mm-hmm. for, mm-hmm. For, um, for growing a business. It mm-hmm. can be, but it's not always. And I hear a lot of talk about getting venture capitalists down here and it's not always the best, mm-hmm. uh, the best solution. Um, the way that we were able to grow and, and expand in the commercial sector is uh, partly the government funding uh, paid for it, paid for uh, the development and the testing of a lot of the technologies. Uh, and they take you just up to the point where you you really need them, and then uh, then you're left on your own. Um, and, and we filled the filled the needs with uh, uh, the bank helped us out and, and some investors. Mm-hmm. Very good, very good. I think I see a typo there. Did I put in vulture capital? I meant venture capital. No, or did I mean the other way? I don't know what I mean. No, it looks like, it looks like. Um, So what has helped you the most? Um, let's talk about that in, yeah. your, in your startup. So, you know, really, the uh, um, I made the decision about seven, seven years ago, six or seven years ago, to really push and focus the commercial commercial products and the commercial products came out of our government funded work mm-hmm. um, and we knew that we had something when we got uh, feedback um, from the industry that's, that, that we had developed uh, some technologies Partic- it, it, this was particularly in the area of, of turbulence detection and avoidance so the airlines started to give us feedback that there was something that they'd be willing to pay for in, in, in what we developed so how do you how do you then make that transition from the uh, doing the government work to developing the commercial products? Well, the first thing I did was uh, formed a board of advisors mm-hmm. of uh, senior good. executives who could help me uh, build uh, a knowledge base. Well, they they would bring the knowledge base, but it, the things I needed were strategy management and access. Mm-hmm. And uh, those were things that these these folks I, I picked them specifically to uh, to be able to provide me with that the strategy in terms of how you go about approaching the airlines, what, what the offering is, um, what what the business proposition is to the airlines and the various other folks in the industry. Um, management is and how to how to build this up and how to how to build the company to, to do some a uh, whole set of new tasks mm-hmm. from what it was done before. Um, and then access to um, very senior senior level people in that CEOs and VPs in the, uh, in the airline industry as well as uh, top level in FAA mm-hmm. etc. So that was very helpful. Mm-hmm. I, I, I couldn't have done that on, on my own. You know, I've I've, I've heard of uh, of people that have started similar things like that uh, advisory councils. You're the first one I've talked to who actually did it. Uh, so first hand information. So so that's great. So essentially. That was a form of mentoring, uh, oh, yeah. if you will, yeah. right? Yeah. Uh, not unlike what we're doing today, and for the for the uh, viewing or listening audience, yeah. it's a form of mentoring. Yeah, because there's nothing new under the sun. Someone yep. someone's always done something similar in the past, and the, it's good to get the people who have done it successfully, as well as the ones who have done it unsuccessfully. Because yeah. that's, that's always important. Good to show. Know. Good show. Um, risks taken. Uh, we talk about uh, entrepreneurs being risk takers. Yeah. So um, it's yeah. There's a big step. I mean, this is this is classic crossing the chasm, crossing Jeffrey Moore's chasm. Uh, um, the, the the risks are obviously dollars. You start to borrow money and or put your own money into a venture. You don't mm-hmm. know if it's going to be successful. Mm-hmm. There, there's a dollar risk. Mm-hmm. Also, any infrastructure you have to build up, and we we found that the infrastructure that was being imposed on us by our potential customers was going to be very very costly. So. What do you do? Do you either give up the venture or you figure out how to do it? And then there's there's the other way that was that act, was actually very successful for us is establishing the right partnerships, and um, we were able to commercialize the product through uh, establishing a partnership with uh, with a larger company. Mm-hmm. 
And although that sounds good, there's an element of risk in there because the, that the, the larger company doesn't guarantee any success. It, it improves you. If, if you get the right deal in the right company, it improves your potential of success. But uh, uh, it's a you know it's a, a tough. It's a tough thing to give your baby to uh, someone else. Oh, yeah. And, and they bet. say, don't worry, we'll look after it. Uh -huh. And uh, off you go. Yeah, off you go is right. So obstacles yet that you over overcame in the process. Yeah, so we were, you know, whenever you bring out something new, even you know what we were doing, it was evolutionary, not revolutionary. But you bring out something new into a conservative industry. Um, especially if you're at a... a uh, uh, an eight or ten person company mm -hmm. you know that that's an obstacle in itself uh, so the partnership with the larger company helped reduce those obstacles plus we uh, we got some pushback from some research entities that were out there who thought we were somehow uh, um, encroaching on their their turf um, that's since gone away but there wasn't much that, you, that, mm -hmm. we, that we could do about that mm -hmm. there was a, a government entity so we had to sort of fight that but not fight it if, if, uh, if, if that makes sense so mm -hmm. there, there were a few obstacles out there mm -hmm. well, and it sounds like you, you've overcome them uh, uh, yeah I think so yeah. yeah that's outstanding and and um, undoubtedly as a as a business owner you're, you're gonna have more obstacles along the way and it's what you learn and <laughs> Um, how you get around those it's all obstacles mm -hmm. <laughs> very good very good um, yeah, I've got a, a question in here about any significant awards we we've talked about uh, um, your involvement with the uh, entrepreneurs organization in Southeast chapter which is a outstanding uh, group of business people from from all industry sectors it's not just technology although you're you know you're, you're considered technology you know uh, aerospace uh, you know combination but uh, uh, you've been a member of EO for how long? I'm just going into my second year. Yeah, so far so good. Oh yeah, it's, great. it's a great group of people, yeah. isn't it? You guys do Absolutely. some great events yeah. and very supportive. It's a lot of fun um, and a good, good networking group. Yes, yeah. yes, indeed. And uh, I'm not sure if, if you know if there's any awards that you want to mention. Feel free. And uh, yeah, we were. Um, uh, I was um, nominated for an Aviation Week. Uh, wow. Laureate Award um, in 2011. Congratulations! Even the, yeah. even getting the nomination is huge. Yeah, I was pretty. I was pretty pleased. Good for you. We got beaten by the Air Force and Lockheed Martin. Oh, combined. it's a stack deck. <laughs> it's a stack deck. Uh, <laughs> you so should have won. The nomination's pretty good. I yeah, that's really exactly right. Who can I write to uh, to, uh, to rescind that decision yeah. and get it going your way? Um, business training. You're. Uh, I mean, you're an outstanding business person. Where'd you learn it? <laughs> Just, uh, I think the the key was to make your mistakes with either someone else's money or not too much money. <laughs> I, I had no business training. I did a part of a, a, a MBA accounting course, yeah. and, but no no formal business training. Um, just learned along the way and uh, asking for help. Um, I'm, I'm always willing to to understand what I don't know, to know what I don't know, and and to to find out someone to help me. Very healthy outlook. Let's talk about some of the lessons that you did learn along the way. Yeah. So you know, it, someone mentioned to me uh, when you're develop, developing or doing something new, um, a lot of the time is spent in bitter disappointment, <laughs> which is pretty <laughs> miserable. But I think the fact is, I mean, it really is a it, it, it can be a roller coaster, but one of the things that I learned was that uh, news is never as bad or as good as it seems at first. Mm -hmm. So you could find something out that's really, really great, the best news ever, and you know, after a while, it turns out it wasn't quite that. Same way you can hear just a catastrophe, and 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 so you you know, you think the world's ending, but then after a day or two, it's just not that bad. So. Yeah. You know, I think that's something to keep in mind. Um, but perseverance also pays off. Just stick with it. Now that's a tricky one because you know, if you stick with the Titanic, it's not <laughs> it's not going to help you out. That's right. Um, What's those violin players doing on the deck there? Right? Exactly. And and also, you don't know all the answers going in. So, and and as engineers really want to know all the answers going in. That's a good point. But they don't. And and you can't. 
very analytical and, and uh, yeah. yeah and so you know at some point you have to say well I don't know but let's 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 get into it or not yeah that's uh, I mean that's a great point and there is a there is a distinct difference uh, and we're not saying good or bad but just managing technical leading technical resources the analytical the engineers the technicians is different from non-technical I yeah. mean people are just wired yeah. differently absolutely you know um, we talked about uh, business culture um, we've talked even about some of the recommendations for businesses in, in Hampton Roads unless you'd like to expand on that you've talked about perseverance and yeah the importance of mentoring any any additional well, points you know um, I, I gave a I gave a talk about this, uh, actually it was to, to Civic, uh, mm -hmm. a couple of years ago, because the question was, what what does Hampton Roads need to grow small businesses? And the fact of the matter is that um, uh, if I was to, I could, I don't need the people who work for me to be here. Um, they could be all over. In fact, some of them are. They're in. Mm -hmm. They're in Kansas, and mm -hmm. they're in. Uh, uh, they're up north, and they're they're out west, or whatever. Mm -hmm. These days, they don't need to be here. Virtual the only people, yeah. yeah. The mm -hmm. only people I need here, uh, as it happens, you know, since my staff have been here f for so long, they live here, and it's nice to have them here, and I can walk into their office, and and but and, and they can walk into mine. But, you know, uh, what. The question comes up: What what does Hampton Roads need to offer a company uh, to start up here? And uh, it, it's not like the old days where where you actually need to have everyone here. Now there are some businesses where you do, like uh, there are some construction companies. Obviously, they need to be here. Mm -hmm. So, but from my perspective, I I, I use people from all over the place. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, obviously, what's what's of interest to me is uh, is a, is a the tax environment, mm -hmm. um, the uh, the ability to get uh, access to the internet, mm -hmm. um, as as well as what's good for me here is there are some very highly qualified people living in this area, mm -hmm. and so it's nice to be able to just reach out and uh, and and talk to them. You know, a couple important things come to mind. Uh, first of all, that twenty first century um, workforce, that virtual workforce, and typically business retention strategies um, uh, traditionally are based on bricks and mortar and physical space and you raise an, uh, an excellent point for our economic development groups around the region to understand the difference in, in traditional business and the businesses of today and the future mm -hmm. and uh, and so it, it it should not not that as you point out, there's organizations that are bricks and mortar focused and, and centric, and that's great, and there should be programs for them. But there also needs to be programs for the small and medium sized businesses that are not bricks and mortar yeah. focused. So that's an excellent point. Um, we talked about, uh, in, in fact, you also, I'm going to drop down to workforce because you mentioned, you know, the, there's the, the peninsula, there's the south side, obviously, two thirds of of uh, the population is on the south side, one third north side, but it seems like there's a higher concentration of high tech, and certainly aerospace industry on the in the peninsula. So, so how how is your ability to attract workforce when you need it, and 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 what kind of challenges and observations do you, do you have about the workforce? Well. Uh when we when we need a particular capability, um, uh, it's usually not here, and we usually know where where to find it, mm -hmm. and uh, so we really don't have um, that sort of a problem. Mm -hmm. uh, our, the kernel of our of, of of our staff is is located here, but we work with folks in the UK and all over the world and, and, yeah. and all, all over the, yeah, country. the country. So, you know, there, there's really no need to for someone to pack up their bags and and move here. It's just mm -hmm. um, it would be an unnecessary cost and and not needed. So that virtual workforce and the people that you're mentioning, Paul, are, Paul, are they typically the engineers? So yeah. we have contributing engineers really yeah. from all over the country and, 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 and the world rather. Yeah, and we work with a company in the UK and uh, 
we can dial into their computers and yeah. and they do all of the processing that we need and we can look at the the results on their computers it's we we don't need them here yeah that's that's a good point back to that virtual workforce in fact again another story one of my career stops was in US robotics for several years and uh, we had engineering mm -hmm. uh, teams in Israel mm -hmm. and uh, and in fact uh, um, even some of the uh, the Russian countries. I mean, we had people all over yeah. the world. So, and, and that was back in the in the late '90s. So that's only getting more so. So, so trying to build up, particularly in the in the technology development sector. So trying to build up lots of people in bricks and mortar. Um, I don't think it's really going to mm -hmm. going to work here necessarily mm -hmm. uh, because you really y you you can go all over the mm -hmm. world. Yeah, all righty. But having said that, th there's a very good uh, a cost of living and standard of living down here, mm -hmm. so it's a nice place to be. Yeah, quality of life is superb, yeah. superb. So, um, and you've got experience attracting workforce not just locally but but internationally, as you say. So what are some of the, the recommendations that you would make to the job seekers of today? Are you getting people out of college, fresh out of college? Are you getting experienced engineers? You know, and maybe that's a variable answer based on the audience. Well, we don't, I was thinking about it, we, we, over the years, we haven't looked for uh, people, we've looked for solutions, meaning mm -hmm. we've got a program, we need this done. So who can do it? Um, and so a lot of this stuff, when we've gone outside of these walls, it's been on a contract type basis. Mm -hmm. So we've subcontracted mm -hmm. things out. Mm -hmm. um, and, and we, we kind of know where to go, but we've, uh, you know, we can cast a wide net. Mm -hmm. So, but as far as a, a job, if, if someone sent me a resume today, you know, we, have, we don't really have any positions open, but if someone was to send me a resume, they would need to explain to me clearly that they understood my company and mm -hmm. they understood the problems I had and mm -hmm. they could solve them. And um, I, I don't want to uh, have to read a resume and then try and figure out where to fit them in because that wouldn't work. You know, that's a, a great point. Uh, and Brad Scott, who is one of your colleagues from MEO, tells the story about a person that he was interviewing and. Uh, and one of the first questions out of the candidate's mouth was to Brad was, so tell me, what does your company do? Yeah. And, uh, you know, so word of advice to job seekers out there, um, and you heard me in the introductory, introductory session of this dialogue, uh, mention to Paul that in my research of his company, I, I knew what he was focused on. Never come to an interview without knowing about the company. That uh, yeah. that you're talking to, because you need to, uh, you need to, make sure that you're a good fit for it. Even if you're, even if you're not, and there's no way you can tell that you are just from our website. Make an attempt. Make an attempt. Yeah, That's exactly so right. Well, we talked about why you decided to do business in Hampton Roads, uh, because you came from the the NASA Langley uh, yeah, experience. Yeah, and, and, and tell us more. Yeah, we're really back in the late '90s. Uh, we needed to be here. We were doing a lot of work sure. actually on site at NASA, mm -hmm. and flying in their airplanes, etc. Mm -hmm. But that's really tapered off. As it happens, I, I got a great group of guys here, uh, guys and girl, women uh, mm -hmm. here. Um, uh, but you know, I could be using people from anywhere mm -hmm. really on, mm -hmm. the, on a contract basis. But uh, I'm based here, and um, you know that sort of so it sort of came over the past uh, 15, 20 years, that, that's how it ended up. Outstanding. Well, and it's certainly our hope that, that you stay here in Hampton Roads. You're a great contributing business to our, uh, our regional fabric and our economic vitality, so we hope that you continue. Any closing remarks that you'd like to make for, uh, for the uh, listeners? Well, a um, couple of things. There are some very, very good organizations down here. There's the EO, as, mm -hmm. uh, as you mentioned. There's the Civic Leadership, which mm -hmm. is a, another great uh, networking facility. Quick, uh, quick commercial there. Um, uh, Paul and I are both Civic grads. Um, I was in uh, class of 2009, of course, the best class of, of all time. And Paul, you were in? 2003, which 
best class of all time. Was actually, yes. The, yes, actu yes, the yes. actual best class yes. of all time. <laughs> so, Not so the one of We are civic colleagues. <laughs> That's right. So, um, yeah, so, I mean, there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of opportunity, and especially now we're, uh, now we're, we're not geographically limited, but also it means that you don't have to move away in order to really maximize your opportunities so that, you mm -hmm. know, you can, you can do that here in this local area. Yep. Um, and there's plenty of people who can, uh, uh, who can help out. Mm -hmm. Outstanding. Well, in, uh, you know, I want to once again, thank you very much for your time, your very valuable time. As a president and CEO, owner of a business, uh, time is money, and, and we appreciate the opportunity to, uh, to meet with you and chat with you and for you to share your views to, uh, to the, uh, the younger businesses uh, within Hampton Roads to help them grow. So My once, pleasure, Dan. Uh, thank you very much. So once again, uh, our thanks to Paul Robinson, president and CEO of Aerotech Research. Keep watching that company and think about them when you're, you're flying the friendly skies. So thank you very much, Paul.